brethren and sisters. Some uh, one mentioned last night that they wanted to be included. Well, we do want to meet with your good pleasure tonight, Brother Hires, oh, even though we're not the servants of men, I'm sure you must understand that. You'll be uh, glad to know that I did speak with the people that you felt would be profitable to instruct me <laughs> last night. Brother DeWelt, Brother Dunning, Brother Hunt, Brother Blakely. Of course, I had the advantage of knowing them better than you do, which is obvious by your analysis of their statement. But they all concurred that it would be better if, if they spoke with you and told them, told you what they meant by what they said. We found ourselves to be in perfect unanimity. Uh, it just appears our unity is unable to be perceived by yourself. So, of course, that is not a surprise to me because it appears as though you have had a considerable amount of difficulty understanding what God has said, so it's not strange that you would understand what his servants have said. Now, I'll deal with some of these questions that you, uh, you gave me. I do, uh, I must say this, uh, I do respect Brother Hyatt. I do not respect his position. I would not be here if I did not respect Brother Hires or if I did respect his, his position. I would not be here in either one of those cases. So I come as, uh, uh, not as his adversary. I'm sorry, <laughs> I'm sorry you painted me as your adversary, Brother Hires. I really am not. Our adversary is the devil who walks about seeking whom he may devour, and I'm certainly not trying to devour you. As to your motivation, you will have to establish that. All right. Please indicate. <clears throat> Whether each of the following statements is true or false. Worship must be offered to God as authorized by divine truth, true or false. Now here's the disadvantage that I'm at here. I have been uh, schooled by God in the scripture not to evaluate the questions of men as highly as the questions of God. Uh, the issue with God is whether God must be worshipped. And that I will concur. Yes, it is true. Thou must and thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. That I say amen to that. God does not uh, add this remainder here, and so uh, I do not acknowledge that as a valid concept at all. After all, it was your own principle that said we cannot go beyond that which is written. You made that uh, statement. You set that parameter, and yet you have gone beyond what is written in this question. Worship may be rendered to God according to that which one devises and prescribes for himself. Well, such an such a approach is not made in Scripture at all. It's a foreign thought. Uh, if this uh, is a, to an unknown God, this is certainly the truth. When the Apostle Paul arrived at Mars Hill and surveyed uh, their idolatrous practices, he didn't say you worship God wrong. He said you worship the wrong God. You, that's the issue in Scripture. It's not whether God's worshiped right or not. It's whether God worshiped. It's the true God that is the issue. Is it possible for there to be and for there to exist in our days such a thing as vain worship? Yes, indeed. Uh, as the Scripture says, in vain they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. But Jesus himself interpreted that for us in the preceding verse when he said, They honor me with their lips, but their hearts is far from me. That's the commentary on this. Uh, those that teach for doctrines the commandments of men are those who teach the fear of God, as Isaiah put it, by the precepts of men that regulate men's worship by precept instead of by faith. That's the whole point of the scriptures. So yes, it is possible for vain worship to exist, but not in a true heart. Are there any restrictions on what a New Testament Christian may offer as worship to God? Now, <coughs> I've read the Word of God for a number of years, and I'm sure you have too, as well as many of, of you. And uh, this has a strange connotation to it. You have to depart from the Apostles' doctrine to, uh, to receive these sort of things. The Word of God talks about offering spiritual sacrifices which are acceptable unto God, and they're sanct it's sanctified by faith as it's offered up to God. There are restrictions on if, and I do not choose to even honor this terminology, uh, offer as worship to God. The restrictions, uh, so far as coming to God is concerned, is that it must be through Christ. It must be spiritual worship, not worship with the hands. God's not honored with that. 
not worship with carnal ordinances, as is taught in Hebrews, the 10th chapter. It must be spirit uh, worship that proceeds out of a cognizance of who God is. You, and you cannot worship an unknown God. Which of the following practices, if any, would you oppose if offered by Christians as worship to God? Burning incense, using rosary beads, uh, religious dancing, handling snakes as a token of worship, using meat and potatoes at the Lord's table. Well, if we were to confront a situation like that, I would say that their problem is that they do not know God. We would not tell them how to worship God. We would expound God to them. We would take the God that has been revealed by the Lord Jesus Christ and expound him. When Paul talked to the Athenians, who obviously worshiped according to your unauthorized principle incorrectly. He did not say, now folks, you're worshiping him incorrectly. Here's the liturgy that you must use. Here's the approach that you must use. He proclaimed God. People worship incorrectly because they don't know God correctly. They are unaware of him. He is, it is God that is revealed in Christ Jesus, not a routine or a liturgy. If you would oppose any of the foregoing items, Please state on what scriptural basis you would do so. Well, let's just take one, meat and potatoes. I heard a man today say that he had a newspaper clipping on uh, some church that had used meat and potatoes, I believe it was, or hamburger and potatoes, something to that effect. At the Lord's table, I have never encountered such a thing. It would, I would be interested in seeing that article if the brother's here to see that. I would oppose that not because God said not to do it, but because it did not agree with the con with the, the form, did not agree with the content. Uh, the, the bread is the body of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the form in the kingdom of God agrees with the content. Uh, if so, with baptism, which of course is the obvious, uh, uh, the obvious uh, illustration of that. We are immersed into Christ Jesus because it is the form of the truth. He have obeyed from the heart that form of the doctrine, the death, the burial, the resurrection. A form in Scripture must uh, comport with reality that uh, it must convey truth to be valid meat and potatoes would not of course you must ask yourself the question why we don't do that uh, we continually are assaulted with this uh, question you have opened the floodgates and yet uh, yet nothing or nothing of this is coming in we observe the lord's table perhaps quite similarly to yourself our new testament christians engaging in worship in observing the Lord's Supper, and is it script, a scriptural requirement for them to do so each Lord's Day? Well, they may and they may not be engaging in worship. The, uh, the point is whether they discern the body of Christ. Uh, Jesus said, this do in remembrance of me, not this do in worship of me. Of me. It's our impression with the great salvation that's in Christ Jesus who has taken away our sins and reconciled us to God. And I continue to affirm this, that it's difficult indeed for me to conceive of a person being reconciled to God and then being held at arm's length by regulated worship, externally regulated worship. Incidentally, externally regulated worship and systematized religion is more owing to John Calvin than to the doctrine of the apostle. That's why we have all these elaborate quotes that have been given to us of men uh, of a scholarly rank that have given us their definitions of worship. It's because the apostles can't provide these definitions, and that's what I have consistently called for in this, uh, in this debate. Is there a scriptural requirement for them to do so each Lord's Day? What uh, do you mean a scriptural requirement? A scriptural precedent? A commandment? Jesus said, as often as you do this, do it in remembrance of me. We have an account in Scripture of someone that did gather together on the first day of the week to break bread. I don't do this because I have to. I do this because I want to, because my heart has been touched with the love of Christ, which constrains me. Now let's look at this second set of questions. <clears throat> You have stated worship is never associated with a fixed interval of time or a set of required circumstances. Yes, that, that is what I said, and if, it, if that's not true, we just need a word from God on that. That's, that's all. That will suffice. Just then uh, I'll tell you what, you can take it from any text of Scripture, from Genesis all the way through Revelation. I'm not sure whether you recognize Genesis through Malachi as Scripture, but at any rate, you can select it from there uh, at, at, your, uh, at your discretion. Is the Lord's Supper an expression of worship? It's an expression of remembrance, and it's a proclamation of the Lord's death till he comes. Now, this is how the Holy Spirit speaks about the ordinance. 
Now, Brother Hyers has spoke of it as an act of worship. But when Jesus talked about it, he spoke of it as an act of remembrance. And when the apostle wrote of it, he said, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Uh, I, I don't see why you have so much difficulty with that sort of nomenclature. Are the elements, bread and fruit of the vine, required circumstances? Well, <clears throat> I don't know of any place in Scripture where we're commanded to use those. Uh, I would, uh, well, I reserve the right to be wrong in that. If, if there is a text that says that you must use this, I would be interested in that, in that text. I do use them, not because I'm commanded, but because their use comports with what they're representing. The, uh, the fruit of the vine represents uh, our Lord Jesus Christ who, who uh, endured the crushing, bruising blow of God for our redemption, who uh, bore in uh, his body our sins upon the tree. And the fruit of the vine most properly depicts that, him who endured that uh, wrathful blow of Almighty God. The unleavened bread perfectly per portrays our Lord Jesus Christ who was without sin and had no guile in his mouth, who was separate from sinners and did not have the leaven of malice nor wickedness. So it perfectly agrees with the one whom I am remembering. And somehow to me that seems a more powerful incentive. And I appeal to the audience here. I appeal to your good sense and to your awareness of God. Does it make sense to observe the Lord's Supper out of a sense of obligation or because you perceive what the thing is all about? I suggest if you don't perceive what it's all about, you eat and drink damnation to yourself as the apostle taught, not discerning the Lord's body. You stated last evening there's not a single reference where those in Christ are instructed on how to worship or where a group of believers ever worshiped. Well, again, we just need a, a text on that. That's that's all we need. Where is that stated? Uh, instead of asking me these questions, just give me the text, the reference, where it is said that a group of believers met together and worshipped. Just uh, that, that will suffice everyone here too. We are uh, all students of the Word. Well, most of you honor yourself and uh, portray yourself as Bible-believing people, and I respect that, and I give credit to you for that. You obviously are students of the Word. I will bow to the Word of God. I will not bow to the Word of man. It doesn't make any difference who it is. I will not. The Word of God must be cited. Since you stated last evening that no believer was ever arraigned by the apostles for worshiping wrongly, Please tell us the meaning of Paul's rebuke of the Corinthians regarding their misuse of the Lord's Supper. Well, their misuse was that they, in your language, didn't worship. They did not discern. That was the whole point. They didn't come to God properly. They were not worshiping. They were not discerning. They were not remembering. You can't worship wrongly. I mean, such a cost. It's like you're saying that there's an angelic devil. You, you can't do that. You can't do what worship is right. It is never wrong. It can be vain, but not wrong. <laughs> yeah, I see you missed that because it said in vain, uh, in vain they do worship me teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. It wasn't their act, you see. It was their position that voided their worship. You shouldn't have laughed so quickly. <laughs> Please define will worship, about which the Apostle Paul warned the Colossians in Colossians 2.23. Well, strangely enough, the will worship mentioned there is uh, the approach to regulated conduct, exactly like you are portraying to us tonight. Yeah, touch not, taste not, handle not, which indeed have a show of wisdom. Uh, you can regulate a person's conduct by setting parameters, fences around his conduct so you can come this far, no further. That has a show of wisdom, the apostle says, but not in any honor to the satisfying of the flesh. That is to say, it cannot squelch the lust of the flesh. It cannot take away a person's appetite for what is wrong. Will worship <coughs> is an attempt to worship God, if you please, by, uh, by discipline instead of by insight and by the love of God and the love of Christ, which constrains him. If worship is rendered vain, by teaching the doctrines and commandments of men, what effect does it have to teach and to practice the doctrines and commandments? Well, that's not the point of the text. The point of the text was they honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Now, Brother Hart, you are a judge, and I ask you this question. Are you saying before this audience that my heart is far from God? 
Are you saying that I am not acceptable to God? Is that what you're saying? That's what Jesus was saying. <clears throat> now, the Word of God does not address worship like you do. And that's what concerns you. And if you think it does, please, somebody in the audience, please, somebody, find where the Word of God addresses worship the way it's being addressed here. The way, uh, the way Brother Hires has addressed it. You would do us all a favor unless the Brother Hires shows us the signs of an apostle and reveals some new insights that he has received from heaven about the approach to worship. We are on strange and foreign territory here. In Scripture, it's not worship that's the point, but the worshiper. There in John 4 and verse 24, that text which you refer to quite frequently, he said, the time is coming when the true worshipers shall worship God in spirit. For God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. The point is that true worshipers can't worship falsely. And they're not true worshipers because they worship right. They worship right because they're true worshipers. The Lord Jesus Christ saw a time when God was going to purify men's hearts by faith. Take out the stony heart. Write the law upon the heart. Put it upon the mind and conform their nature to his whereby beholding the glory of God in the face of Christ Jesus we would be transformed into the same image from glory to glory. Now that's the gospel that the apostles preach. Not a, a gospel of regulation and of rule. Where the road of apostasy leads. I commend you on the appearance of these charts incidentally. That's one thing you've done very well. Now, Brother, I don't even know who Brother Winder is. So, of course, I can't take the credit. You must uh, appreciate my stand there. I can't take the credit for Brother Winder's statement. And as to my quote here, I said God has not made these pronouncements. Well, again, of course, all we need is a text of Scripture where he did, and that will negate that. Logic will not negate this. A statement from God. Uh, will negate this. The other two statements are not my own either. Blakely's basic premise, all acts or actions employed in Christian worship is acts or actions of worship without scriptural authority are acts or actions which are nevertheless acceptable to God. Well, you're, you're presupposing it's an either or matter. This is the old law concept, do this, do, and live. But the Word of God says that the kingdom of God does not consist of meat and drink, but righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. And he that in these things serveth God is acceptable of God and approved of men. Now, are you saying, Brother Hires, that I am not serving God in righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit? If you are indeed affirming that, you are on dangerous territory because you have judged another man's servant, and thus my real judge will speak in my defense. Blankley's basic argument. My point in there is that whoever serves God in possession of righteousness, this is right, the righteousness of faith, Abraham believed God and it was imputed to him for righteousness. It wasn't written for his sake alone. It was written for our sakes also. See, these are strange things I can tell to a lot of you people. As I quote this, this is strange language. You should ask yourself, why in heaven's name is the language of the apostle when he gets to talking about justification? Strange language to me. This ought to be music to your ears. It was not written for his sake alone that it was imputed, but unto us, unto us also, to whom it shall be imputed, if we worship God right. To whom it shall be imputed if we believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. The word that we preach is this. It is not that we must go up into heaven to bring him down or go out down into the depths to bring him up. The word is nigh thee, even in thy heart and in thy mouth, even the word of faith. It's a great emphasis about the word of faith Brother the hires is given. Here it is. Even the word of faith which we preach, that if you shall confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart, that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the mouth confession is made unto salvation, and with the heart man believes unto righteousness. I affirm that that flies right in the face of this whole approach 
to worship? Or are you saying that I have not confessed the Lord Jesus with my mouth and that I have not believed in my heart that God hath raised him from the dead? Um, <clears throat> now I want to just pause to say a word here that I had hoped I would not have to say. Uh, I understand that there are in debate technical procedures to try and gain the upper ground. And in the flesh, and only in the flesh, I can see that approach. But this is a carnal approach. This is not of God. This is not an apostolic approach to try and misrepresent your uh, adversary as I have been painted. I suggest to you that if you misunderstand what I have said or what some of my other brethren have said, you should come to us as the Lord has said. Go to them, yourself and him alone, and try and get to straighten out in your mind what we have said. Do not attempt to malign us or paint us as being divided among ourselves. After all, it would seem to me you have charged that the flood, I have opened the floodgates by saying that what God does not regulate our worship. It seems to me that some kind of floodgate has been opened in your own group of brethren. You have by latest estimate, depends on who you talk to, from 19 to 41 separate divisions. And every single one of them to a division is because of the employment of this law that you are trying to bind on me. So if you were to convince me of it, I would be very confused on which group to join. I would, incidentally, one of your brethren that is here tonight suggested that we change the words over there, instrumental music, and put over there Sunday school classes and multiple cups. Now, of course, uh, I, this is kind of his foreign stuff to me because I, I don't think in those terms, but it might be interesting if you could elaborate upon that to me and then explain what is it that has opened up this floodgate of division among your own brethren? When I read in the Word of God of division and confusion of speech, I read about like the Tower of Babel. And confusion was considered a curse and division a curse. So I would think that should merit uh, investigation, close investigation. How much time? 2 Corinthians, the fifth chapter in verse 7 has been referred to several times. That we walk by faith <coughs> and not by sight. The legalistic approach to this is this, that uh, what God has said we do, that's walking by faith. But this is in direct contradiction to the teaching of Romans, the tenth chapter, verses 5 through 11, where it states that the law is not of faith, that we, that we walk by faith by embracing what has been achieved for us not what has been commanded to us. We obey him because we have apprehended uh, the truth of Christ's atonement for us. Now I challenge you, Brother Hires, to see how God uses the word faith. We walk by a persuasion of what God has done, and that's how righteousness is imputed to us. Thank you. I count it a joy to be back before you once again for a further affirmation of the proposition and to deal with the matters that Brother Blakely has said in the speech just before us. First of all, he told us that as I had recommended for him to do, he got with several of his brethren last night after the debate. I do not doubt that for a moment. <laughs> As a matter of fact, I could tell by his last speech that some of them had been talking to him because somebody said, you had better answer those questions. That is leaving a bad impression upon the audience that you're refusing to deal with the questions that have been presented. And so he has come along now in the very first speech that he has made in this debate. Here we are into the second night of the uh, first proposition 
and he has now finally decided to deal with some of the arguments and the questions presented to it. And I am delighted that he's endeavored to do it. But I was surprised by what he said in his very first statement. He said that he had talked to Brother DeWelt and to Brother Dunning and to Brother Hunt and to Brother Fred Blakely and that he understood what it is that they meant to say and that they all agreed it would be better if they talked to me than to him. Well, I don't know why. I agree with what they said. <laughs> They don't have to convince me. I'm satisfied with the statements made by every one of them to which I've made reference. I certainly do agree with Brother Don DeWelt in the statements I quoted last evening, where that he identified uh, certain expressions of worship with the assembly, including congregational singing in Ephesians 5.19 and Colossians 3.16. I agree with what Brother DeWelt said in that quotation. Not only that, but I agree with what Brother DeWelt said up here about worship must be directed by truth and according to the truth. And last night when I first introduced that statement and before I identified the author of that quotation, you remember that Brother Blakely said then that is the very opposite of what John 4.24 is teaching. Now tonight he says, after I've told him who said it, while we are in agreement, I understand what Brother DeWelt was saying. He didn't understand it last night before he knew who said it, did he? He got his understanding after he found out that he was in direct contradiction to his own uh, brethren here who are in attendance at this debate. And he implied a few minutes ago that it is an improper technique for me to array him in these obvious contradictions with his own brethren. Well, I knew before I came here that Brother Blakely would not be satisfied with uh, my technique. But I deny with every fiber of my being that there is any impropriety about it at all. I am meeting a position here that has caused and created division in the precious body of Jesus Christ for more than 100 years. And I am showing what has been taught, and I am dealing with the efforts that have been made to defend the practice that is on trial. And I have shown and am continuing to show that what Brother Blakely has done in his efforts to defend the practice is to repudiate the very efforts that have been made by all of the others in the past. He has departed entirely from prior efforts that have been made to defend the instrument, and what you are hearing and have heard in this debate is an entirely different procedure to that which has been employed in the past, and I cannot refrain from pointing out that to all of those that have relied upon these tactics and positions and arguments in the past, Brother Blakely has made it emphatically clear those efforts have utterly failed. No question about it. Because when Brother Dunning and others endeavor to show that instrumental music is authorized, and that's what his proposition said, that's what he signed his name to defend, when he endeavored to show that instrumental music was authorized, Brother Blakely has come before us in this discussion and said that is not so. He has said there is no such thing as authorized worship. And I believe that I have a perfect right to stand before you and to show the consequences of the doctrine of the man that I am debating. That has been a perfectly legitimate uh, means of manifesting the truth in debate from time immemorial. It is obvious that the consequences that follow from a man's argument are properly introducible and are legitimate considerations. 
And what it amounts to in this debate is that he is saying Dunning failed. He is saying that Hunt failed. He is saying that Boswell failed. And this is one thing on which Brother Blakely and I are utterly in agreement. But I would not have expected it to come from this source. And the very fact that he makes the line of argumentation that he does is evidence of the fact that he does not believe that their defense of instrumental music was proper. Because the foundation of his argument tonight is a denial of the very premise upon which they proceeded. So down goes their arguments world without end. Down goes all of the efforts they have employed in the past to show that uh, instrumental music is authorized in a Christian worship. And that is exactly what they affirm, as I showed uh, conclusively and clearly last night, from the very wording of propositions that his brethren have affirmed down through the years. He's repudiated that. He's repudiated the very basis of it, and in the process, therefore, has said they utterly failed in their efforts in defense of instrumental music. Then he said that he was not my adversary. Well, he's my adversary in this debate. All that refers to is the same thing as an opponent in debate. He's on one side of this issue, and I'm on the other. I certainly don't mean anything unkind by referring to him as my adversary. And then he referred to Genesis through Malachi and said that he did not know whether or not we regarded that as Scripture. I'm surprised if he does not know and I'm disappointed if he did know and made uh, an assertion of that kind. We certainly do believe that all scripture is given by the inspiration of God and he has said numerous times in print and otherwise that he is a regular reader of the uh, publications among uh, those of us who oppose the instrument and he could scarcely have read very much without knowing that we believe in the inspiration of the entirety of God's word. And not only that, but I have Old Testament passages up here on the chart which should certainly clearly show that to be the case. And I am surprised that Brother Blakely would make a statement of that kind. Then he came again tonight and said, Show us uh, where worship is used in the Scriptures as you use it. Well, I don't know what more I can do. I hardly know what else to say. I have presented this time and time again, and he refuses to notice it. Why does he not deal with the uh, statement that he himself has made? Is he going to tell us that it is unscriptural? He said in his paper in April 1987, worship can also be used of individual acts of homage. He said last night that you cannot talk about acts of worship. Why does he not deal with his own statements along this line? I have shown him the definition of the word proskuneo involves an act of reverence, and that is the most frequently used word for uh, worship in the New Testament. Why does he not deal with it? Instead of constantly making these unsupported assertions that I have not shown what is involved in New Testament worship. I have pointed out that we're to worship in spirit and in truth. And that to worship in truth means that we must be directed by and guided by the Word of God. And that, my friends, is regulated worship. He may speak of it condescendingly. He may speak of it, as he has tonight, as an unauthorized concept. But to worship in truth is to worship according to truth, and if it is according to truth and directed by truth, it is regulated worship. And then he made reference to the chart that I placed before you a while ago about the extremes that have been taken, justifying now the rosary bead. Justifying now meat and potatoes on the Lord's table. Justifying now sprinkling in connection with immersion. He said he did not know Brother Winder. There are others of his brethren here tonight who know him. And know that he is the author of a book uh, widely circulated among them in 
defense of instrumental music in worship. And about all he could say about that chart was, well, these are not my statements. But that was not the point, Brother Blakely. These positions are the logical consequence of your position. That is what I have shown. That if there is no regulation of worship and if there is no authority needed for worship, then there is no way that one may deny any of these practices. And he made something of a pretense tonight at answering my questions, but he overlooked a great many of them said very little about most of them, and we'll see that very shortly. And all of these things that I have pointed out, though said by others, as I pointed out initially, are the logical result of the arguments that are being made in order to favor instrumental music in the worship. Even to the degree of saying, well, if somebody wants to use the rosary beads, I cannot say it is wrong. But I want you to know, Brother Blakely, that just because I have the rosary beads up here tonight, I'm not worshiping with them. I'm using them to count the arguments I've made that you have not answered. <laughs> then he said, will he say that I'm not serving God? And he asked a number of other questions about uh, himself and about his position. I say that he is not teaching the truth in regard to the matters that we're debating here tonight. I certainly believe that, and he must believe the same about me since he signed the proposition in the denial tonight. And he said uh, that I might be judging another man's servant. Well, John 7 and verse 24 says that we're to judge righteous judgment, but I'm not intending to judge him in any sense condemned by the Lord, but the Lord said, by their fruits ye shall know them. And Brother Blakely, I am a fruit inspector, and I see the fruits of your doctrine and of that which you are teaching. And I have shown those tonight unmistakably from those who agree with your position. Then in reference to uh, the quotations that I have given from those who are identified with him, he says that I have misunderstood them. I do not know what they meant to say, but I know what they said. And this audience knows what they said. And I do not have any difficulty in understanding what they said. And I'm willing to abide in what they said. And he suggested that Matthew 18 meant I had to go to each one of them personally before I quoted their public statements. That's a misapplication of Matthew 18, which is talking about personal grievances among brethren. It has not one thing on this earth to do with having to go to a man and talk to him privately about a public utterance that he has scattered out in books and publications to the four winds of the earth. And then he said, but you are divided. That was after he uh, told me that it was improper for me to try to show the division among them. And I've become accustomed to the fact that he contradicts himself on a regular basis. He turned around then and did the very thing that he had criticized on my part. But let me show you this. I would not deny that there are divisions among those of us who object to instrumental music in the worship. But I will say that I have a great deal more in common with my brethren with whom I disagree on these various issues, but who nevertheless believe in the authority of the Scriptures than I do with Brother Blakely, who emphatically denies the authority of the Scriptures. And the fact of the matter is, they're divided on the very issue that we're debating. They're hopelessly divided. 
Some of them say that instrumental music is in the worship. Some of them say it is not. Some of them say it is authorized by the Scriptures. Some of them say it is not. Some of them say it is an act of worship. Some of them say it is not. Their division is on the very matter that we're discussing, and they're divided on other things, too. Among them, the very inerrancy of the Scriptures themselves. And I have before me an article here by Jack Cockrell from the Christian Standard, November 7, 1982, the very first sentence of which says, It is now public knowledge that a considerable number of preachers, teachers, and leaders within the Christian churches reject the inerrancy of the Bible. Public knowledge, Brother Cockrell says. They do not believe that the original manuscripts as first penned by inspired writers such as Moses, Matthew, and Paul were necessarily free from errors and mistakes. And then he adds, this is serious enough, but even more serious is the widely held notion that it really doesn't matter whether one accepts inerrancy or not. That's the kind of division they have that relates to the very trustworthiness of the Word of God itself. Then I want to refer to what he has said about these questions. First, on the questions that I gave him last evening, it was hard to tell what his answer was to most of them. I asked him if he would simply tell us, are these statements true or false? Now, I commend Brother DeWelt. When Brother Warren presented a similar list to him, he went down the line and did not hesitate to say, this is true, this is false, this is true, this is false. But not so with Brother Blakely. He did not say that uh, in a distinctive way about a single one of these. He said, worship must be offered to God as authorized by divine truth. He said, I do not accept that. Now, isn't that a shame? Isn't that a tragedy? That a man would deny that worship must be offered to God is authorized by divine truth. Brethren, this tells you where they stand. Worship may be rendered to God according to that which one devises and prescribes for himself. He never did say true or false about that. I think he finally said, no, I would not accept that phraseology. He did say it is possible for there to be vain worship, but he said not uh, in the true heart. I'll say more about that when time allows. Are there any restrictions uh, on what a Christian may offer his worship? He said it must be through Christ. It must be spiritual, not with the hands. I guess that rules out the piano. (laughs) Not carnal, must be offered to God. Which of the following practices, if any, would you oppose if offered by Christians as worship to God? He commented uh, fully on only one of them, and that is using meat and potatoes on the Lord's table. And he said... uh, that the basis on which he would oppose that is that it would not conform to the purpose. Why would not meat conform to the body of Christ? Tell us that, would you? But he said, we don't do any of this. I have shown here tonight that they say there'd be nothing wrong with it. That's the point. It's the natural consequence of the effort they make to defend instrumental music. You see that it opens the floodgate. And it is an absolute denial of Bible authority. That is what is so serious about this matter. And my friend, we'll deal with these other matters in our final address, but think seriously about the seriousness of these positions that lead to the absolute rejection of divine truth. Brother Jackson and uh, Ben and Brother. I do want to, to commend you for your interest in the truth and for attending these sessions. <clears throat> I can understand Brother Hire's concern about me not dealing with the 
questions that he asked the first night that I was here, but I, if you will replay the tape, you will see that I did say I was going to come back to those questions later, that I felt that I must deal with the, with the proposition first, and sought to establish, of course, that the proposition itself was an erroneous one, containing erroneous concepts. I'd uh, like to show chart 26, please. Now, as I have stated previously, and Brother Hires has made mention of this, uh, no believer was ever arraigned by the apostles for having worshipped wrongly. And he cited the 1 Corinthians 11 text, which, of course, their aloofness from God was the very point of the text. Now, I showed this chart before, and I, I want to show it again to show why I opposed the, quote, unauthorized principle. The early church <clears throat> was surrounded by a number of circumstances which seems to me to have mandated a number of unauthorized occurrences. The church was in its infancy with a very limited amount of knowledge and understanding about the things of God. It was fresh out of Judaism, having retained a lot of the old Jewish customs as is evident throughout the book of Acts. Uh, there were false apostles that went out with the false doctrines, and the apostles warned of them, saying that he went out from us, but they were not of us. There were Judaistic teachers that uh, bound upon people's circumcision, saying that uh, except you be circumcised after the manner of Moses, you cannot be saved. There were fresh out of idolatry in such uh, cities as Corinth and, and Galatia and Ephesus and Colossae, Cities renowned for uh, astounding idolatries and perversions of the flesh. The scriptures had not yet been compiled, the apostolic writings, and the apostolic visits were apparently infrequent and uh, very sparse with many of these churches. Now, here was an ideal atmosphere for someone to worship God wrongly, for someone to do something incorrectly, for someone to offer up to God, inadvertently or however or deliberately, to do it wrong, to worship God wrong. Yet we don't have a single occurrence of anyone being upbraided for that. We have uh, no particular curses uh, stated about someone worshiping God wrongly. They are the folk that do not worship God, of course, as stated in Scripture. Again, I want to assert that the point in Scripture is whether God is in fact worshiped. That's the point not whether he is worshipped wrongly. There were no explicit warnings against unauthorized actions, particularly as regards worship. Instead, the Lord Jesus told the woman at Samaria, in this very text that he continues to refer to here, that the key to this was the worshiper, not the routine. He said the hour is coming when the true worshipers shall worship God in spirit. For God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. Now you have a two alternative set before you. One is that God is worshiped in spirit and truth because a certain liturgy or routine is followed. Uh, I reject that. The second is that God is worshiped in spirit and in truth because of the truthness and of the worshiper. They are true worshipers. Hearts having been purged of an evil conscience, a body's washed with pure water, the heart purified by faith, sin having been removed from them as far as the east is from the west, they were made acceptable in the beloved. I propose to you that the scripture nowhere, nowhere presents the possibility that such a person could worship unacceptably. Unacceptable worship comes from unacceptable people. I'd like to call for chart number 27. There were a number of occurrences in Scripture where people were upbraided and rebuked by the apostles, and it ought to be of note to us to observe some of them. <clears throat> there was the case of Ananias and Sapphira who were guilty of lying to the Holy Spirit. There was the case of Hymenaeus and Philetus who taught that the resurrection was past and overthrew the faith of many. Notice none of these are wrong acts of worship, so to speak. Now, there was Diotrephes, who, who John upbraided because he loved to have the preeminence among the brethren. There was the Corinthian fornicator who lived with his father's wife and was uh, ex ex commanded to be excommunicated from the church because of his involvement in sins more heinous than even the Gentiles committed. There was a church at Ephesus which uh, 
worship correctly. Goodness, their routine was absolutely right. They, uh, they uh, acquitted themselves before God in their external appearance very wonderfully. But the Lord Jesus says, I have somewhat against you. You do all the right things. You say all the right things. You try those that say they're apostles and you find them to be false, but you've, you've left your first love. Now, that's not a, not a matter of an open liturgy. There was Simon the sorcerer who sought to uh, buy the gift of God with money. There was the Corinthian church guilty of not discerning the Lord's body who experienced the unusual tasting hand of the Lord. There was a church at Pergamos who permitted uh, the doctrine of Balaam which taught people to eat meat offered to idols and to commit fornication. You notice that very carefully in all these things we're not talking about acts, quote, acts of worship or worshiping God incorrectly. Again, the church of Thyatira permitted Jezebel to uh, eat meat sacrificed to idols and to commit fornication. The church of Sardis, their works were imperfect and they were ready to die, having experienced much the same thing at Ephesus. And alas, the church at Laodicea that suffered from lukewarmness, even though they too appeared to have done everything correctly. Uh, I'd like to call for chart 16. <coughs> suggest you that the authority of Christ from the power perspective is the issue here. All authority has been given unto me in heaven and in earth, Jesus said. And the objective of his authority is to give eternal life to as many as God has given him. That's the issue. It's not to instruct people on how to worship God. Jesus did not come for that purpose. He came to reveal God to us and a revealed God that is perceived, it is impossible to worship him wrongly. You must depart from God. You must lose your first love. You must wax lukewarm. You must close your eyes to the Lord. You must trample underfoot the blood of the covenant and do despite to the spirit of grace. Quench the spirit. Grieve the spirit. These are the actions that the apostles uh, painted as a jeopardy to the saints of God. Now, if worship is not divinely regulated, your entire proposition falls to the ground. That's been my position all along. And we need, of course, a text of Scripture where God says, and this is uh, the routine that you go through. Worship in spirit and truth. Are you saying that that's a routine? That this is an action? That this is the act of reverence? That the act of reverence is in spirit and in truth? Or is this the thing that makes the act an act of reverence? My definition here, as you call it, is not a definition. I am commenting on worship, that worship has a very wide latitude. It ranges all the way from the heart to the falling on the face. Abraham and holy men of God fell on their face and worship. Uh, it wasn't the falling on the face that did it. It was the uh, spirit and truth in the heart that made it an act of worship. So a mere liturgy will not constitute worship. Chart number 71. <clears throat> Incidentally, I want to draw to your attention that we have uh, this act of reverence, the authority there is a footnote. Now, I know you don't use Schofield's Bible, but it sort of does remind me of Harry Rimmer's experience. Uh, I really can't it receive a footnote as a definition of worship. I, I hope I'm not faulted for that. <clears throat> Now, in Christ Jesus, according to Hebrews, the 12th chapter, a remarkable thing has happened. And since we are talking about coming to God and being received by God and being accepted by God, I assume that this is what we're speaking of. I see no relevance to this issue if we're not talking about being accepted by God. The apostle points out to us that the situation that confronts us in Christ Jesus is we have not come in a physical manner to God. The new covenant is dramatically different from the old one says we have not come to a mount that can be touched, uh, that, that had fire and blackness and darkness and tempest and, uh, which men could not endure, an accommodating sort of a revelation of God. It was all external. We have not come to that. Where we have come in Christ Jesus, we have uh, come to Mount Zion uh, unperceived by the eye, and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to an innumerable company of angels and 
to the general assembly of the firstborn and to the church of the firstborn which are written in heaven to God the judge of all men and the spirits of just men made perfect and to Jesus the mediator of the new covenant and to the blood of sprinkling that speaketh better things than that of Abel it is a wonderful place in which we have come in Christ Jesus now it is inconceivable that here in the spirit having come to these heavenly personalities and beings that we would worship God unacceptably here. That here in the presence of Almighty God, we have come, that we are come to these things. By faith we have come to this. This is what the gospel does. This is what Christ Jesus died to procure. This entrance into this heavenly place, he has raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places. Now that worship can be incorrectly up here, this I find a lot of difficulty with this. The scripture presumes that getting there is the main thing and that in Christ Jesus, that's where you get. You come into the presence of God. Where is the presence of God in scripture ever painted as being surrounded by worshipless beings? A people who worship personalities worship in the presence of God. They cannot help but do it because their eyes of understanding have been opened up and they've been illuminated. Once Peter knew who Jesus was, he fell down and worshipped him. Now, John might have counseled him a lot. Oh, Peter, you should fall down on your knees before the Lord Jesus and say, Depart from me, O Lord, I'm a sinful man. And he wouldn't have got the job accomplished. But once Peter saw who Jesus was, the worship problem was resolved. And it is for God's people, too. You see, we are the circumcision which ought to worship God. Is that what it says? We are the circumcision which worship God in the Spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. And under the law, of course, the whole system of religion was in the flesh. It was the religion of carnal ordinances. I hope that I also will be understood when I say I cannot accept men even of Brother Warren's caliber to define uh, what worship means or any other man. We must have a word from God. You see, we are God. Now, we have said that my position is on trial. Now, actually, my position isn't on trial till tomorrow night. That's when I go on trial. Tonight, Brother, I'm, I assume that's with a negative. <laughs> Brother Hire's position is on trial tonight. Tomorrow night, uh, I go on trial, and we'll see how that, how that fares. Here, uh, in Christ Jesus, we must have a word from the Father on worship. If I'm to be judged, and my worship is to be judged, and the activities that I engage in are to be judged, I must have a word from God. Not an inference, not an implication, not an interpretation. I must have a word, if you please, from God. <clears throat> The either-or concept which we have presented to us tonight is not of the new covenant. It's not of that sort. It's, 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 well, the either-or is true in this case. You're either in Christ or not in Christ. Now I'll go along with that. But when it comes to either-or in matters of conduct, there's an amazing amount of latitude, even down to shaving the head and keeping vows under the old Jewish economy and, and offering an offering in the Jewish temple, uh, such as the Apostle Paul did. My... I would, uh, I would wonder what he would think of a regulated form of approach to God because he said of that incident, which is recorded in Acts 18 and Acts 20, that he went up for to worship. Well, thank God Brother Hires wasn't there to tell him that it was invalid. Now, you have stated that our reasoning will lead to the abuse that the floodgates is open and that we are divided. Well, my point, Brother Hires, in mentioning my uh, conversations with Brother DeWelt and uh, Brother Dunning and Brother Hunt uh, is that we are not, in fact, divided. We are, we are one. You can will all be willing to talk us with you at the table and tell you that we're one. But now, I, maybe I'm wrong, but I get the impression that that is not the case in some of these uh, groups that uh, are divided over the imposition of the very principle you're trying to impose upon me. So if it must be imposed upon me, it appears to me that there are a number of other people in the audience here that might very well be offended. <laughs> I you say that you could tell that someone spoke with me because I dealt with the questions. Well, you, you must not uh, 
to judge me after that manner. I, ha I had intended to deal with them and told you that I would deal with them. So uh, do not impugn, please, my motives or my approach. I agree. I agree with uh, what they said. You said of my brethren. But uh, I perceive that you do not perceive their intent and their purpose. You have assigned your own meaning to their words and assumed they were fortifying your position when in fact their very statement was against your position. They were on the negative side, you know, of those debates. You say you have heard tonight an entirely different procedure. And I, and I thank God that, that that has come through. I indeed intended for it to be an entirely different procedure. Not because we've repudiated the former procedures, God forbid. It's because the other one was too hard for you brethren to see. So we have taken an alternative course, you see. <laughs> I mean, after 150 years of taking this approach, uh, we oughtn't, uh, we're not to say it's invalid any more than God after trying to speak to the Jews through the prophet. I sent rising up early in the morning and te teaching them. He did not repudiate the prophets when he sent Jesus. And neither have we repudiated this position because we have a past position because we have taken another view. We are saying that there are multiple approaches to this. I have chosen to take one that views it from a different vantage point and uh, is not to be construed a judgment against my previous brethren. Now, I was glad to hear that uh, you confirm that Genesis to Malachi, you do view them as the... Now, you didn't say you viewed them as the scriptures. You said you viewed them as being inspired by God. They are scriptures. I, I know that you believe this. I just, <laughs> I just wanted you to say this, you see, before the audience. Because I don't want to be faulted when I appeal to the scriptures. Now, you say you are a fruit inspector. What fruit have you seen in me that leads you to believe that I am not a Christ? What fruit have you seen in me? Have you witnessed in me? Now, you must inspect my, me, myself. What fruit have you seen in me that sets me against the Lord's Christ? Now, Jesus has already said, he that's not against me is for me. Jesus has made that pronouncement. Are you affirming that I'm against Christ? Are you? If you are, then you have indeed a Herculean task on your hands. I believe that I will leave with that. This is the last opportunity that I shall have to come before you in the affirmative, and I am content that the affirmation that I have made in this discussion will stand because Brother Blakely has made no real assault against the principles that I have enunciated here last evening and tonight. He has not dealt with all of the passages that I have here on the chart, on the authority of Christ. Uh, some of them he has not mentioned at all. He has not dealt satisfactorily with any of them. He has not discussed a single uh, one of the objections that I placed over here against instrumental music. And so we come to the very last speech of the affirmative, and he has but one more speech in which no uh, new material can be presented according to our rules. And he has not dealt with the arguments that have been presented. And so here we come to the very uh, last uh, aspect of this part of our debate, and Brother Blakely has allowed these things to go unanswered because uh, they are unanswerable. These are divine principles. These are matters of divine authority, and they will stand when this world is on fire. Let me uh, see uh, chart number uh, 22. Now, his statement here at the very last that, uh, yes, he did take a different approach because the other was just too hard for us to see. Uh, we were, uh, after all, somewhat dense and uh, thick-headed, and it was hard to get these uh, more uh, sophisticated ideas across to us. Well, it may surprise Brother Blakely to know that most of us understood those arguments better than the ones he's attempted in this debate. Uh, he might be better off to go back and try a few of those. He's given us esoteric uh, philosophy in this debate, very little scripture and very little reasoning and uh, no rebuttal at all. And I pretty well understood what these fellows were saying in the past, and that may come as a surprise to him. But despite his efforts to say that they are one and that they are not divided, let me make very clear to you that the only sense in which they are one 
is in their defense of instrumental music. They all agree that they are going to have the instrument. They all agree that they will justify the instrument. Yes, they are united on the conclusion, but nothing he has said and nothing he can say will allow him to escape from the fact that they are not united in their argument and in their positions. <coughs> I put this chart up last evening showing uh, various propositions that they have affirmed. And one of them is the New Testament authorizes the use of mechanical instruments of music in worship to God. Dwayne Dunning affirmed that in the Shelley-Dunning debate. And any person who was here last night knows that Brother Blakely vigorously objected to the expression mechanical. His whole argument was based on the fact that there is no such thing as authorized worship and that instruments of music are not in the worship because it is neither defined nor regulated. And window dressing will not cover up the fact that he has utterly repudiated the arguments that his brethren have made in the past. And when he gets up here and says to us, we are not divided, we are one. Oh, I understood that they were one in that all of them agree with the practice of instrumental music, but they most assuredly are not one in the efforts they have made to defend it. And the fact of the matter is they have cast about for arguments uh, that will assist them, and the reason that he's arguing as he is tonight is not because we were too thick-headed to understand the other arguments, but it's because they could not prevail with any arguments they had made in the past, and thus he has left them all behind and has endeavored to plow new ground. And he's done no better than any of his brethren of the past. Now I want to refer uh, to the questions that I did not get to in the last uh, address. Uh, in the questions <clears throat> given to him last evening, are New Testament Christians engaging in worship in observing the Lord's Supper? And is it a scriptural requirement for them to do so each Lord's Day? He said, well, they may be or may not. Now, a little later, he contradicts that, and I'll show it if our time allows. And uh, then he had a good bit to say that uh, we don't uh, do things because we have to. I'd hate to think that we just acted out of a sense of obligation. Well, we don't disagree with that. But I do not believe that a command of God negates spiritual worship. Brother Blakely, is it a command to love your wife? And do you just do it because you're obligated to? I happen to know Brother Blakely's wife is seated down here at the front, and she might join with me in requesting him to answer the question. <laughs> then the questions that I gave him tonight, I said, you have stated worship is never associated with a fixed interval of time or a set of required circumstances. And then I asked, is the Lord's Supper an expression of worship? He said it's an expression of remembrance. Now, is that fair? <clears throat> Notice how studiously he avoids trying to define anything as being an act of worship. And I am shocked. I'm shocked that he actually will not admit that partaking of the Lord's Supper is an act of worship. I put a chart up here last evening in which I quoted extensively from his father, Brother Fred O. Blakely, in which he unhesitatingly and unreservedly said that partaking of the Lord's Supper is a part of our Christian worship on the Lord's Day in the assembly. And that's why that I urged Brother Fred to talk to him last night. And now Brother Blakely wants to uh, suggest again, well, I understood what he meant to say. Well, did he mean to say the opposite of what he said? because he certainly said it is an act of a worship in the assembly on the Lord's day. I couldn't get you to say it, but I got him to say it. But he wasn't in a debate. And then I said, is it associated with a fixed interval of time? 
the first day of the week. I don't show that he gave an answer to that. If he did, he'll correct me. Are the elements, the uh, bread and the fruit of the vine, required circumstances? And he said, not required because there's no scripture. Now, he said, I stand to be corrected on that, but there is no scripture that commands it. Could we try 1 Corinthians 11, verses 24 and 25? And when he had given thanks, he break it, the bread, and said, take, eat. And by the way, that is in the imperative, Brother Blakely. This is my body which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. Verse 25, after the same manner also he took the cup which he had supped, saying, This cup of the New Testament is my blood. This do ye. Is that a command to worship? Is that a command involving the elements of the Lord's Supper? It is certainly in the imperative mood in these passages, Brother Blakely. And then I said, you uh, stated last evening, there's not a single reference where those in Christ are instructed how to worship or where a group of believers ever worship. Please answer, did Christ instruct believers regarding the Lord's Supper? Well, he did, as I've just read to you, but I do not show that he answered that at all. Did a group of believers ever observe the Lord's Supper? He didn't answer that. But uh, in Acts 20 and verse 7, uh, when the disciples came together on the first day of the week to break bread, Paul preached unto them. He made no reference to that. Is the Lord's Supper a regular feature of the assembly according to the New Testament? He would not answer, but his father, brother Fred O. Blakely, in a very fine article, by the way, in uh, his two-volume set on the Apostles' Doctrine, has a lengthy exposition that shows that to be exactly the case, and I agree entirely with his father. I asked since you stated last evening that no believer was ever arraigned uh, by the apostles for worshiping wrongly. And he said that again tonight repeatedly. Please tell us the meaning of Paul's rebuke of the uh, Corinthians regarding their misuse of the Lord's Supper in 1 Corinthians 11, 17 to 22. And uh, he uh, had some difficulty with that, but he ended up in saying that uh, they did not worship. He said that is what is wrong. Now notice this. A while ago when I asked him if the Lord's Supper was worship, he wouldn't say. But when he said what they were doing wrong in 1 Corinthians 11 in regard to the Lord's Supper, he said they were not worshiping. Well, that means if you do it right, it's in the worship, doesn't it, Brother Blake? Of course it is. Brother Fred knows it is. His article says it is. And what he says about it is the truth. And certainly they were endeavoring to worship here. They were making a common meal out of the Lord's Supper. Don't tell me that it was not wrong worship. What they were doing was wrong. And that is the whole design of what is covered here in 1 Corinthians 11 in the passage referred to. And then I asked him to define regulated worship or rather will worship, as spoken of by the Apostle uh, Paul in Colossians 2. And he said that was regulated worship. He said that's what uh, that will worship is. Let me have my copy of Thayer. I want to read the definition of will worship as given by Thayer, but I also want to read the passage here in Colossians 2, beginning at verse 20. First, he's talking to believers. Wherefore, if you be dead with Christ from the rudiments of the world, why, as though living in the world, are you subject to ordinances? Touch not, taste not, handle not, which are all to perish with the using, after the commandments and doctrines of men. Well, now here he's writing to those that are believers. And he certainly is making a condemnation of a certain kind of worship. Which things, he says, remember he said they're after the commandments and doctrines of men. He's not merely talking about regulated worship. He's talking about worship that was regulated by the wrong source. Instead of the truth, it was regulated by the doctrines and commandments of men. And in the next verse, he says, which things uh, have indeed a show of worship, of wisdom in will worship. And the very word that is translated will worship there means, according to Thayer, worship which one devises and prescribes for himself. Page 168. Now, that's the very thing that his doctrine leads to because he says that there is no regulation. Well, if there's no regulation, then one may devise it for himself. And he said that in so many words again and again when he said there is no such a thing as wrong worship. You cannot worship wrongly if you're accepted of God. 
And then I said, uh, if worship is rendered vain by teaching the doctrines and commandments of men, you remember last night when I gave Matthew 15, 9, he says, that doesn't say practicing, it just says teaching. So tonight I asked him, what effect does it have both to teach and to practice the doctrines and commandments of men in worship? Oh, he said, their uh, hearts were far from God. That's what's wrong with them. Yes, their hearts were far from God, but why? Because they were teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. That's why their hearts were far from God. Now, here is a very fine article from the Apostles' Doctrine by Fred O. Blakely, Volume 1, published in 1962, the second revision. He says, what is the relation of sound doctrine to the acceptable worship of God? He talks about certain worship being acceptable. Many take the position there is no essential connection. Why, Brother Fred, I know one. <laughs> I know one that takes that position. I certainly do. But Brother Fred says this. Even in the professed New Testament church, brethren who have obeyed the apostolic form of doctrine endeavor to come before God with mere lip service. To all such, our Lord's clarion word should come with power. In vain do they worship me. You know, last night he said, that's not talking to the church. That's talking to the unbelieving Pharisees. Brother Fred says, this talking also to the New Testament church. To all such, our Lord's clarion word should come with power. In vain do they worship me. Listen to him. When shall we learn that we can only come to God in God's appointed way? That contradicts every syllable of every argument that his son has made before this audience tonight. Because he says God has no appointed way. I do not expect him to deal with this, but it is a sacred principle. Thank you kindly for your attention, your interest in our study tonight. And Brother Hires, Brother Jackson, and brothers and sisters, and if there are others who are not in Christ here tonight, uh, we address you to and, and appeal to you to give heed unto these things that you have heard. I first of all want to thank Brother Harris for the time that he's spent. I know this has been at some personal inconvenience to yourself, and I appreciate uh, this endeavor to enter the arena of thought and to challenge uh, one another and our brethren with different perspectives and approaches to the Word of God. Now, you have <coughs> mentioned that we are one, those of us who I said were agreed, we are one only in the defense of the of instrumental music. Of course, that is a bit, uh, a bit restrictive. We are, we are united on a number of other things than that, as you must know. But uh, I also observe that many of you, brethren, are united basically only on your opposition to the musical instrument. So uh, I let's dispense with that. We shouldn't uh, engage in a my dog worse or better than your dog, but we both sort of cast in the same dilemma for the heart. And uh, my point is that, the, is that the difference in your brethren is due to the application of the law of exclusion. That has been my point uh, all along. Uh, I like chart three, please. Now, this is my closing speech. I want to recall to your minds once again the proposition that Brother Hires had. I have referred to it in the first uh, evening as a syllogistic house. Excuse me, Brother You're not supposed to introduce any new material in this final uh, speech tonight. Oh, oh well, all right. This is not new material, but all right. Chart 18. That chart is again they said exactly the words that I said in the first evening. I had challenged Brother Hires in the first evening to provide us with a single reference where those in Christ are instructed on how to worship or where a group of believers worship. And he did cite for us instances that he thought meant that people worship, but they did not say that that was the case. If no references can be provided, how can you be so sure of what is authorized? Chart number seven, please. 
Again, I'm attacking the language that was employed in the proposition itself. That the proposition presupposed a network of interrelated requirements, prescriptions for people to come to God. And I deny that that was the case. Where in any age or at any time was worship divinely associated with er external actions or procedures? What is the basis for the supposition that the worship of God is or ever has been detailed? Now, those are questions that I raised early in this debate, and uh, I wanted a clear statement to that effect from the Word of God. For in proof, in uh, in proof for the proposition that uh, worship is regulated, Brother Hires has presented, of course, Thayer's comment. And I... I uh, I should have introduced this earlier, I will not tonight, but of course that's the last half of Brother Thayer's comment. The first half stated what I stated, Brother Thayer meant. Uh, perhaps we can bring that up in, the, in tomorrow. Uh, he also introduced to us in proof a footnote, and he also introduced to us a statement from Brother Warren, and also his interpretation of Colossians 3.17, which ought to have been obvious in the very first night that we disagree very seriously about the meaning of that text. At any rate, all of these have been presented because, quite frankly, there couldn't be a definition presented in Scripture that outlined the worship precisely as Brother Hires has. A worshiping in spirit and truth is, of course, not an act, and uh, he has talked about an act and an element of worship. Worship and the Lord's Supper, I stated that maybe they worshiped and maybe they did not. It was determined upon the person themselves. Are you saying that a person that sits at the Lord's table and takes uh, the bread and the cup have worship? Uh, only if they are in discernment of the body of Christ have they, as you put it, worship. I have stated that Jesus commanded we do this in remembrance of him. Wherever that is absent, there has been no affection generated toward God. Now, I appreciate that statement that you made, Brother Hires, that uh, God commanded me to love my wife, and did I do it just because I was commanded? Well, I think she could answer that very well, and uh, God could answer very well that I love him not because I've just been commanded to do so. It's because I've seen him as he has been revealed in Christ Jesus, and he has been compelling to my spirit. I have been drawn toward him, and God nowhere presents to me the possibility that being drawn to him through Christ Jesus and the gospel will be met by resistance on the other side. You have uh, tried tonight, and I apologize to these brethren for this, Brother DeWelt and Brother Dunning, Brother Hunt, and Brother Fred O. Blakely, I, and I regret so for you, brethren, that such a thing as that took place, but notwithstanding, you should have dealt with what I said, not what they said, and they would be the first to go along and concur with that. I do not intend to judge you by what Brother Jackson has said, or about what Brother Elkins has said, or about what Brother Warren has said, That's about what Brother Deffenbaugh has said. We're not here to discuss what they have said. We're here to discuss what Brother Hires has said. I had made reference to Acts, the 20th chapter, in verse 7. You'll, uh, you'll have to play the tape back to, to recall that. Now, incidentally, the, uh, the situation in Corinth concerning the Lord's table, I, I said that they were not borrowing your terminology, worshiping, or in remembrance of the Lord. This is exactly the point of the apostle in 1 Corinthians, the 11th chapter, and verse 20. When ye come together, therefore, into one place, this is not is not to eat the Lord's Supper. That was the whole point. That was the whole point of condemnation, is that they hadn't come to remember, as Jesus had said. That's why he delivered unto them, you should come to remember the Lord Jesus Christ. His uh, objective in 1 Corinthians 11, verses 24 through 25, if you are stating that his objective was to specify what the elements were to be, it appears to me that plain that Jesus was specifying what the activity of the heart and mind was to be. This do, he said, in remembrance. Not this do in this manner. Not this do with these elements. This do in remembrance of me. Will worship? Uh, Brother Thayer 
I assume he was a brother. I'm not quite sure. I'm not familiar with, with Thayer. At any rate, I don't, uh, I don't, of his theological positions, I'm not sure that he's an adequate authority in, in things pertaining to God, being as he's lived uh, of over a millennia and a half after the apostles, an inappropriate uh, authority for the things of God. Will worship. Uh, Thayer says that it's uh, one which devises uh, for himself. Now that, of course, is what the, uh, the point of regulation is, human regulation. Colossians, the second chapter, again, here's his whole point. He said, uh, if ye be dead with Christ from the rudiment, the elementary instructions of the world, why as though living in the world are you subject to ordinance? And that, of course, would be my question to you, were I able to bring that up, is why are you subject to them, which are all to perish with the using. Now, you have introduced uh, some thoughts throughout this debate that have stated that some things that are to perish with the using would not be permitted, if you please, in the worship of God's, pe God's, uh, worship of God's people. But here the apostle says that uh, we are not to devote our attention to those sort of things. They have indeed a show of wisdom in will worship and, and humility. And, and he explains what it means, the neglecting of the body, of forced discipline, if you please. Uh, will worship there again has to do with trying to regiment your worship to God on the external rather than on the internal manner. Now we do not pay mere lip service to God in Christ Jesus. And I want to close with this uh, text in Hebrews, the 10th chapter, one of the great hallmark texts of an approach unto God. In God's appointed way, he quoted my, my father, and uh, indeed it is. I want to read God's appointed way for you to come unto him. Spelled out for you, no interpretation required. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and a living way, which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh, and having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promise. I suggest to you that if you come to God in this way, that's his appointed way, and you will not be turned away. You will not worship God incorrectly, so to speak, if you come in this manner. But this is quite different, you see, from a liturgy. This is language faith can get a hold of. All of these things are things not perceived to the eye of the flesh. They are all things that are within the veil, where God is. How the gospel hearkens you to peer beyond the seen to the things that are not seen, for the things that are seen are temporal, the things that are not seen are eternal, and if with God and Christ and the atonement and your acceptance in Christ clear in your vision, your heart pulsating with the life that comes because you believe that God is and that he's a reward of them that diligently seek him, particularly has expounded in the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. You shall be accepted of him. I thank you, brethren, for your attention.